Hello, and welcome to the Cancer Research Institute, Cancer Immunotherapy and You Patient Education Webinar Series. I'm your host, Dr. Arthur Brodsky, Associate Director of Scientific Content at the Cancer Research Institute. And today we're highlighting the Cancer Immunotherapy Toolbox. How does the immune system work? First, we'll learn some immune basics and then cover some current cancer treatments that utilize the immune system. And then finally discuss novel strategies being explored to fully unlock the immune system's power against cancer and bring us closer to a world immune to cancer. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly thank the generous sponsors of this webinar series, Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as Alchemies and Lilly Oncology. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's featured guest. Dr. Miriam Murad is the director of the Mark and Jennifer Lipschultz Precision Immunology Institute and Humane Immune Monitoring Center at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Dr. Murad is an internationally acclaimed expert in the biology of myeloid cells like dendritic cells and macrophages, which you'll learn more about soon. And she's also a member of the CRI Scientific Advisory Council and has sponsored the research of two CRI postdoctoral fellows. Without further ado, Dr. Murad, I will let you take it from here. All right. Thank you, Arthur, for having me today. And uh, just going to introduce very briefly what we are trying to do when we uh, manipulate the immune system to treat cancer. So first, um, I want to just um, uh, remind everyone that the immune system is a is a, an army of cells that is here to protect us. So army of cells with different functions, like the same as in any army. And But the goal is to really constantly survey for a, a, for a threat and eliminate it. So here, I think this is what we are going to try and show you here. The immune system can recognize, it has the ability to recognize when a cell is damaged, for example, after any type of trauma, for example, a burn or, or a heart attack, or, and, and will clear it, will eliminate these damaged cells. The same during aging, when there is damage that occurred due to accumulated mutation, the immune systems know how to recognize an aged cells and, and, and eliminate it. Same with microbial uh, infection. Any type of microbe can be recognized by the immune system. In fact, it's probably its main role is to protect us against infection. And similarly, it can recognize the cancer cells because the cancer cells look very different from the normal cells. And in fact, we believe that the immune system is constantly eliminating cells that can become cancerous and constantly protecting us from cancer progression. But in some cases, the cancer cells know how to stop uh, the, the, the immune system or counteract this ability to immune systems to eliminate them. And this is when they progress. And the thought was for many years, because this realization that immune cells were present in all tumor lesions has been made a long time ago. But the idea was that, well, if the immune system is, immune cells are here, they accumulate, clearly they can recognize the cancer cells, but if the cancer progress, then you know, the immune system couldn't fight it. But that realization really led scientists to think, well, if they recognize it once and were able to, uh, to, to eliminate or eliminate some of it, then maybe that immune system can be reactivated to fight cancer. And that's really the premise that the cancer immunologists have, is how can we reactivate that immune system that has the ability to recognize damage, to make it eliminate cancer cells in a way, as I will discuss later, in, in a way that is first efficient, but also provide memory so that we'll always remember when the cancer come back. Okay, so here is a slide to remind extraordinary advances in our immunolo immunology knowledge that suggest that in fact, an inflammatory response, that immune system that I just described to you, is in fact part of all diseases, has a role in all diseases, because as soon as there is an injury, immune cells accumulate uh, and try to either eliminate injured cells, as I just showed you, and therefore, and by email, el el trying to eliminate the, this, uh, this dam these damaged cells, it will produce what we call inflammatory molecules. And this inflammation is going to contribute to disease outcome. And in some cases, it improves the disease, often during infection, but sometimes it goes too far and it can be damaging. And we believe that really the biggest revolution in medicine 
in the recent decade is the realization that drugging that inflammatory response can be curative. The, you know, the closest example of that are, are the vaccines against COVID. I'm going to talk about checkpoint therapy in cancer that have been transformative, but there are many other diseases that are benefiting from cancer treatment, um, such as inflammatory disease and you know, psoriasis and multiple sclerosis. And this is just to highlight the power of that immune system of ours. Okay, so that immune system is now quite complex, and this is what we study and I've been studying for more than 20 years. And it will include two big branches, one which we call the innate immune system, and then other branch is called the adaptive immune system. So it's, it's really an army of cells that I've just described earlier, you know, with many function uh, because eliminating uh, uh, eliminating uh, eliminating uh, abnormal or 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 or, or uh, eliminating a threat is, is not an easy task. So the innate immune system consists of different cell types that have the capacity to just recognize a threat without being exposed to it earlier. Right? It just recognizes it has machinery, all the right machinery to recognize when something is wrong. And the good example of that, or the best example of that, are macrophages. Macrophages, cell type that I've been working on for a long time, they are present in every tissue of our body. And their main role is to really try to recognize when something is wrong. And when something is wrong, let's say a cell is damaged, macrophages are going to capture it and try to clear it. But they also release inflammatory molecules to recruit other actors, all the other uh, other uh, cells of the immune system, which we call the fighter cells, to eliminate a threat. Okay. For example, they will rec they will recruit neutrophil. Neutrophil are large cellular compartment, larger number of cells in in our blood circulation. Uh, uh, so, a larger number of cells among the white blood cells that are uh, circulating in the blood, and the neutrophil are very good at eliminating a threat. And, um, and they are recruited when something goes wrong. But there is also this natural killer cell that, that looks like a lymphocyte and also quite good at eliminating a threat without prior education. Now, there are there is this other cell type that I've been studying also for a long time called dendritic cells. And these dendritic cells are also part of the innate immune system. They can also recognize the threat and capture it, but their main role, in contrast to macrophage or neutrophil, is to bring the threat to lymph nodes where T cells and B cells are, and really educate the adaptive immune systems against the threat. Now, the adaptive immune systems are very is, is the normal part of the, our immune system because it it, it 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 has specificity. It recognizes only specific threats, but it also has memory. It remembers a threat, and uh, and it and it has that specificity. They can they kill really on target, and and they will always remember when something is wrong. So what dendritic cells do is bring let's say a microbe or a tumor cell and, and educate T cells to recognize the target and, and to eliminate it. So there's two big parts of the, the adaptive immune system, the B cell that makes antibodies. So for example, when you receive your COVID vaccines, that vaccine is going to educate B cells to make antibodies against the virus, but also educate T cells to recognize potentially virally infected cells and eliminate them. Okay, so how does this killing occur? So here I'm going back to the dendritic cells, first in the education. Education is very important because uh, uh, dendritic cells really are going to decide how T cells are going to behave. So for example, in the case of tumor lesions, dendritic cells are capturing tumor cells, they will process it, express it on the cell surface in a way that is recognizable by T cells, but also produce additional signals to tell, to really instruct the T cells on what to do. And in most of the cases, they tell them, go and kill each time you see a cell that expresses that signal. The T cells are going to go back. So the T cells constantly, constantly circulate in our body. And when they recognize that signal that they have been educated against, what they do is they kill that, the cell that expresses it. So dendritic cells capture tumor cells, present the tumor 
signal to a T cell. T cells recognize the signal on the cancer cells and they kill it. And in fact, it works. It works most of the time. But in some cases, doesn't work. And this is when the cancer grows. And, and, and really what we realize is that the cancer, in fact, that grow have learned how to fool those T cells. And they fool them, but by engaging the signal that stop their activation or stop their ability to kill. And those signals is what we call checkpoint. Checkpoint, for example, the most popular checkpoint is PD-1. PD-1 is expressed on T cells and when it's engaged, it will stop T cells ability to kill. And the engagement of this PD-1 can come either from the cancer cells, but also from the dendritic cells or the macrophages themselves, okay? And why is that? Because in fact, the immune system have also learned to constantly modulate its ability to respond, right? Otherwise, you know, let's say you have a flu infection. If you don't know how to regulate that immune response, we will constantly, we will be dying of inflammatory response. So regulation is a very big part of, of, that, of, 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 of the immune response, as important as the activation, which I just described to you, this ability to educate and kill. At the same time, the dendritic cells are asking T cells to kill. They also constantly modulate this ability to, to, to really react against the threat. And this is, you know, this, is, this is very important for the survival of our species. But sometimes uh, that inhibition goes too far. And this is what we are seeing in cancer. Okay. So now what scientists discovered is that if you inhibit that inhibitory signal, then T cells can again be able to, 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 to target the cancer cells and kill them. And this is what happens you know, when patients are treated with a checkpoint blockade. Okay, so now what we have really built is that instead of now targeting the cancer cells that have proven to be very difficult to target because the cancer cells is completely transformed, it's a crazy cell. So when we give chemotherapy, they know how to really escape that chemotherapy regimen or radiation regimen or these targeted molecules that we've been using, for example, in melanoma. Instead, what we are doing is targeting the immune system. The immune system is, in fact, regulated properly. It's not transformed. It's not cancerous. So we can really anticipate how the immune system is going to respond. So now cancer treatment has really shifted from a cancer-focused treatment towards you know, targeting this immune macroenvironment. And, and, and what we are seeing now is really combination of treatment where we both target the cancer and target the immune microenvironment. And this is really the, 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 the focus of our field is to continue to learn about other molecules that regulate this ability of the immune system to kill cancer cells. Right now, we are really drugging or targeting only three molecules. There are hundreds of molecules that regulate that killing. So many of us are trying to identify novel targets and bring them to the clinic. We are also trying to combine traditional treatment with immunotherapy. We are also trying to identify what we call biomarker of response so that we can identify those patients that are going to respond more favorably to immunotherapy. And also many groups are trying to uh, minimize side effects of immunotherapy and potentially we'll discuss that. Thank you very much, Dr. Ma. That was a that was a great overview of you know the, I think the basics of the immune system and uh, checkpoint immunotherapies, which right now are the most successful immunotherapies. But like you mentioned, they still don't work for a lot of patients, and we still have a lot of work to do to help everybody else. So you know, I guess in that light, I thought it was interesting that you know the the PD one, PDL one that you mentioned, it, it involves more than just the T cells. It involves these myeloid cells, these dendritic cells, and macrophages that you mentioned. They can not only educate and you know stimulate the T cells but also play the other side of the coin of expressing these checkpoints to shut down the T cells. Um, you know, so I guess in this light, because T cells are only part of the puzzle, uh, it makes sense that they, that targeting them would really only account for a fraction of cures, whether it's through these checkpoints or through the cell therapies that also use engineered T cells. Um, so I guess my question is beyond T cells, how are scientists, how, how are we starting to look at utilizing other immune cells, especially these antigen presenting, antigen presenting myeloid cells uh, through new approaches, and how, how might those those approaches improve the effectiveness of immunotherapy? 
Okay, so this is a very important point because something we didn't discuss is that uh, um, the, tumor, the tumor cells know also how to escape uh, this, uh, this T cell response by just uh, not expressing a lot of, of these targets. So sometimes you can educate the T cells very well, but the tumor cells know how to not express the right target or dampen them, right? So finding other ways of killing uh, a tumor is, is, is a big focus of the field. Uh, so let's talk about non-T so non cell killing immune cells, non-T cells. Immune, so immune cells that can kill a cancer, but are not T cells. And there are two of them. Natural killer cells are quite good at killing a tumor cells without, specific, without recognizing a specific target. Macrophage are ex very good at also eliminating any type of damage cells, right? So several groups uh, are focusing on reactivating macrophage ability to kill. You know, what's extraordinary about macrophage is that they are the dominant immune cells in every cancer lesions. The, all, so sometimes, in fact, there are more macrophages than there are, tum there are tumor cells. It's, it's always, it is the definition of an inflamed site. Each time you have anything that goes wrong, you have this big accumulation of macrophages. So several groups are trying to harness macrophage ability to kill and use them as killers. And others are harnessing NK cells. And, and in fact, there is very, very interesting results now with NK cell therapy, where we uh, manipulate and kill cells, in, inject them, and uh, and and have them migrate to the tumor lesions and kill tumor cells. I didn't talk a lot about NK cells. I should have, but I put them in that innate immune system, which means that they recognize without being educated, and that is the difference. Because the tumor can potentially dampen this antigen, the, 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 some of the signals they put on the T cell that on, on the cell surface, sorry, that can be recognizable by T cells, but they very rarely can completely shut down all the, the danger molecules that can be recognized by macrophages and NK cells. It would be very difficult for them to remain alive and not present some of these molecules. So we think these are very, very interesting paths to really harness. And there is another big focus of the field is that immune microenvironment, because what we realize is that sometimes you can educate T cells as much as you want. And uh, in, so the education happens in the lymph node. We didn't discuss that, Archer, but maybe we should just remind uh, um, uh, the public that, that so, so those lymph nodes, Pretty sure that people know what lymph nodes are, are, are really appendixes that are uh, attached to every organ of ours. And, uh, and, and uh, the education of a good response really occurs in, in lymph nodes. So, for example, in let's say we have lung, uh, lung cancer, dendritic cells will capture a piece of the lung uh, cancers, bring it to the lymph node, educate the T cells, and that can happen very well. T cells go back to the lung cancer, and there is macrophage that trying to repair, and 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 in, in their uh, need or desire to repair, because macrophage think, okay, I have to now, I have to now stop the wound. So this is how they are thinking, and how they are fooled by cancer, which um, give them signals to really try not not to clear us, but rather repair us. And the cancer know how to, to say that to macrophage. And, and, and this is something also I should have said about this macrophage is that they, they have an ability to clear, but a very strong ability to repair. And when they repair, what they do is they promote tumor progression. They are bringing vessels, they're trying to repair, bringing vessels and therefore bringing oxygen, um, preventing T cells to kill, uh, uh, to, to, to induce more damage, because macrophages do that. Initially, they kill, and then they try to repair. They constantly do that all the time in our body. And, and, and they are fooled by the tumor. They think that, oh, it's a little wound. OK, we got rid of the most dangerous cells, and now we have to repair. And those macrophages are, part, are, are fooled, are the ones that are fooled the most, in fact, by the tumor. And for a long time, we focus on those T cells, but now we realize that in fact, macrophages 
in their desire to repair are, are, are really preventing T cell function. So I showed that PDL1 being also expressed by macrophage, and macrophage are very numerous, so they are always trying uh, 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 to stop T cell function, but macrophage are also preventing T cell killing by many other modalities which we are trying to identify and block. Uh, you mentioned a lot there, and I wanted to kind of just clarify something for audience. Um, so, you know, in addition to your slides where you showed that the um, the macrophages and the dendritic cells can kind of play a support role or act as the generals of the immune system, they they tell the T cells what to do. They, as you just discussed, also they can they they set the stage. They really determine what the behavior of the whether that environment is going to be shut down with the immune system or whether it's going to allow the immune system to kind of respond. So that's, you know, that, that's the supportive role, I guess you could say. But then also, as you mentioned, they can directly attack cancer cells uh, through a process called phagocytosis. With, with these various roles, could you speak a little bit to how they might be useful on their own, as well as how they might uh, be used in combination, not only with the checkpoint immunotherapies, but also with other potential treatments today. Uh, so as I, I mentioned, you know, the, the, the extraordinary things about macrophage and dendritic cells, and I suppose this is why you are inviting me to talk about these cells in particular, is that they, they have many different roles, right? They eat the cancer cells, present it on the cell surface, educate T cells, but in some cases, they also inhibit T cell function. So how, uh, so, so, uh, uh, if 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 they are surrounded by tumor cells, right? Uh, we uh, and 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 if we improve or enhance the ability of macrophages to capture these pieces of tumor cells, for example, with chemotherapy, we may enhance their ability to present. So we realize already that chemotherapy and the right chemotherapy, the one that don't kill T cells so much, but kill tumor cells mainly, can provide more what we call a cargo antigen to, uh, uh, to macrophage. So there are many groups that are trying to combine chemotherapy and potentially immunotherapy. How can we harness uh, uh, more uh, that those macrophage and dendritic cells by um, uh, by making them more active or less sensitive to uh, tumor ability to dampen their function? So we have also identified how the tumor cells dampen their ability to instruct. A, a, a strong T cell killing function. So this is a bit complex, but bear with me here. So I'm I'm talking to both the audience here. You know, the, it, it's it, the, the, our body is so so extraordinarily well organized, right? The dendritic cells and macrophage are also sensitive to tumor cues, right? If the or, or sensitive to any damage cues, right? So in most, let's say we have an infection, dendritic cells and macrophage are, co are going to capture the, let's say, COVID. And, and they know that things are really not going well. So they are super active and they are presenting the COVID antigen, but also producing a lot of signal for the, to tell the T cell, well, go and kill. In some cases, uh, <clears throat> And in the case of tumor, uh, they are going to present, but they present in a way by saying that they, they present in a way where they're telling the T cells, well, don't kill, in fact. Uh, uh, respect, don't, uh, they, they make them what we call regulatory. They tell the T cells, do not kill the tumor. This is because they receive the cue, as I've explained uh, before, they receive the cue, tell them, you know, we are in a repair mode now. You know, and, and this is how the tumor is thinking about them. So what we are, uh, what my lab is doing, for example, is, is really targeting these cues, right? Blocking tumor ability to tell dendritic cells and macrophages that are in a repair mode, like be kind, right? Tell the T cells not to kill us because we want to repair our tissue. What we are trying to do is uh, uh, tell, bring signal to the tumor, what we call the microenvironment of, of uh, uh, the, the DCs and macrophages that are in this microenvironment to tell them there is very bad things that are happening here. And those signals come from our understanding of uh, an infectious response. We know that dendritic cells and macrophages are not fooled by microbes rarely. They can be fooled also by chronic during chronic infection, but they know how to recognize microbes. And, 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 and all this knowledge is being used to devise, in fact, novel therapy to target dendritic cells and macrophages, make them resist uh, tumor ability to 
tell them to be in a repair mode, make sure that they will constantly activate T cells and not make them what we call regulatory, and also identify other checkpoints. I've told you that those PDL1, the checkpoint that engage, you know, checkpoint on the T cells, identified other molecules that engage checkpoint on T cells. In fact, we have identified you know, many new regulatory molecules by really looking at dendritic cells. So we'll use, as you know, you know, high dimensional technology to really look at the molecular level of how dendritic cells behave in tumor. And we identify many other regulatory molecules beyond, you know, the PD-1, PD-12, one pair that we're targeting right now. That's awesome to hear. It's definitely, definitely a very exciting time. Thus far, we've been talking about, uh, you know, established tumors, pa patients that are already in the hospital and need to get treatment for large established tumors. Um, but, you know, we're also starting to appreciate the role that other immune cells uh, and the immune system in general, you know, plays during the, de the development of cancer and the progression of cancer. Um, in addition, you know, as we've been discussing how they might respond to treatment. So as, as we're learning more about the immune system um, and, you know, and the role that it plays during the development of tumors, what opportunities might there be, um, you know, for treating cancer earlier and potentially even preventing altogether? Okay, so this is where, you know, the excitement resides really is to go as early as possible because we think that, you know, what we all want to do and, and we usually not use this term too much in, in cancer, what we want is, is cure cancer, right? We want to eliminate those cells and prevent them from coming back. And we think that if we go early, uh, during cancer progression, this is where we maximize our chances of, of curing the disease. Although we are also trying to cure, you know, established tumor, and we are having you know, great success, and we think we can continue to build on this success, early seems easier, okay? And in fact, there are already uh, uh, data that suggest that, that this is happening already. So for example, in this early squamous cell cancer, you know, cancer of the skin, we know that activating a very strong immune response is sufficient to eliminate cancer cells. We know it, for example, uh, uh, in, in bladder cancer also, when we had this superficial bl bladder cancer, BCG therapy, which is really a way of, of providing, let's say, microbial signal, as if you have, a, 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 let's say, a tuberculosis on, 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 in, in your bladder. So we provide, of course, microbial signal that, that just activate the immune system. Of course, we are not providing a microbe. We are just providing things that looks like, 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 like microbes. And this is sufficient to activate the immune system. And, and this is, uh, in turn, eliminating you know, cancer cells. So we know that this is possible. Right. So while you know, at my institution, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, we are now the largest hospital of New York City, and we have put enormous, uh, uh, in fact, um, we have invested in, in, in enormous uh, um, means to really develop very solid screening program. And, and we, the can our cancer immunology program is very attached to this screening program. So we want to, and screen is, uh, during the screening process, this is where we identify this very small tumor and our hope is there by activating very strongly the immune system, we can more easily eliminate those cancer cells. So that's a big part of the focus of our group, but many other groups in the world. And, and CRI is very interested in funding these type of studies. Another uh, big hope of ours is to prevent cancer progression. And um, this is a little bit more complex, right? Uh, but um, it requires different type of thinking, which we, we are going to predict that if we can, let's say, vaccinate against some more common tumor antigen, we may prevent you know, tumor progression in, 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 in some organs. And, and there's a lot of effort that also are being done to uh, identify those common tumor antigen, which we can, uh, that are commonly used and commonly expressed by most tumor cells, or at least by, by tumor cells in specific organs, and, and, and how we can vaccinate uh, against them. So these are really the, the, uh, the two, it's a pocket of, of, of studies that are being done now, you know, to, to really, with the hope of, of, of curing cancer in the future. So I want to zoom out a little more now. Uh, you know, we've been talking about the immune system's impact throughout the course of cancer. 
But as your slide showed at the beginning, you know, the, the immune system and the inflammation or lack of inflammation plays a role in almost all diseases that we know of. Um, and I, I know it's still really an early field, um, but I, I wanted to kind of bring in some of the more recent and surprising findings, especially with regarding the microbiome and diet and things like that. The microbiome for our audience is the microbial species that live in and on our bodies, mostly in the skin and especially in our intestines, bacteria mainly, but also viruses and fungi, which can prime the immune system and determine how the immune system acts. So I guess, you know, again, it is still very early in, in these explorations. What do we know about how our lifestyles and other factors influence our immune system? Uh, you know, not only in the context of cancer, but impacting other diseases and even our health in general. Yeah. Yeah, no. So I, I just want to uh, maybe emphasize what you said uh, again, because this is uh, definitely a big focus also of, of uh, you know, the, the, the institute that I, I lead here at Monsana is, is really thinking about that immune system across diseases. And also, uh, how can we learn, you know, from really studying the, the, the immune response to different uh, uh, disease. You know, we've seen that cancer immunologists have had tremendously our fight against COVID, right? Because COVID patients were dying from this bad inflammation. And in fact, oncologists have studied uh, inflammation for a long time and we're quite active in trying to modulate uh, uh, immune response in organs and, extra and, and, and they played an extraordinary role in both the design of vaccine, but also uh, uh, in clinical trial um, and in our fight against this pathogenic inflammation. So it's very important that uh, uh, we study that, that, that immune response across different diseases because we could learn, in fact, we can bring principles from one organ and one disease to, the, to, to another, and that can really always facilitate and accelerate progress. So you had this specific question on microbiome, which is one aspect where uh, we can in, indeed, uh, through uh, you know, nutrition or, or other, uh, uh, external influences, you know, modulate. So microbiome are all these microbes, you know, trillion of microbes that 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 populate our intestine, but are also present in the skin, potentially in our nose, in our ears, in our mouth, uh, and are are uh, playing a very important role in, in really producing metabolite that we know shape immune response. And we have seen in, 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 in cancer patients that specific microbes are associated with good response to immunotherapy. And now there are interventional studies where uh, patients, cancer patients, are being, in fact, uh, um, fed or, or sometimes with different uh, therapeutic strategies, we, we provide different type of microbes uh, in their intestine and see whether we, this, uh, by changing the microbial, what we call microbial composition, we can in fact modulate cancer treatment. And, and we have in fact some early success that are very encouraging. But we also know that what we eat in fact define our microbial composition. Uh, so there are several studies showing that, for example, eating uh, red meat has a, a very big impact on uh, what we call biomass, on the number of microbes. So microbes love meat. So the more e uh, red meat you eat, the more microbe you have. We also know that fibers change com also completely uh, the behavior of, of microbes. So we know that that microbial composition and potentially function can respond to uh, to different nutritional elements. And there is a lot of work on, on, in this area trying to shape. You know, probiotic was the early uh, work, but now there is very serious studies where we are trying to modulate the composition of microbes and definitely uh, uh, eating uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, eating strategically, I was going to say, but maybe there are better words for that, uh, it can have an impact on our microbiome. And, 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 and because we modify the microbiome, you can modify, you know, what we call the metabolite, and you can impact your immune system. But we know also that exercise, exercise is an extraordinary potent way of, of really stimulating your immune system. Uh, we know also that sleep, sleep has a dramatic impact on uh, the, what we call uh, the, the wellness of, of our, uh, or the fitness of our immune system. The less you sleep, uh, we know the less your, your immune cells are, are really fit or respond um, 
uh, responds properly to, to cues. There is also, so there are studies, for example, here from, from Sanai and from other groups showing that the jet lag can also impact the release of immune cells from the bone marrow. You know, the immune cells are produced in the bone marrow, released in the blood, and from the blood, they go to all organs. And that release of immune cells is significantly, significantly impacted by jet lag. My lab showed that eating, in fact, impacts the release of immune cells. We showed that if each time you eat, you release uh, immune cells, but you should. But but this excess release is not very good for you because you shouldn't release so many immune cells in your blood circulation. So since then, I eat much less. You know, I eat one or, or twice a day, uh, but I used to eat at different times during the day, and and uh, and it's probably not so good because humans we are not used to eat all the time. We used to eat when we were hungry, and now eat uh, you know food being so easy to find the tendency is to eat all the time and and our body is not used to this right so there are many ways where you can control potentially the number and composition of the immune system and and i will say now clearly food uh, sleep and exercise is the best way to really maintain a healthy immune system um you know you mentioned uh, at the beginning how uh, unlike other treatments, you know, chemotherapy radiation that act directly on the on the cancer cell, with immunotherapy, with us trying to strengthen the immune system and get the immune system to do the job, if our immune system is compromised to begin with, that's going to make it a lot less effective in treating cancer, even with the help of immunotherapy. Yeah, no, absolutely, and also, you know, something we didn't mention at all is how this bad immune system can also promote cancer progression. Right, so we know that a bad inflammation, uh, you know, immune system that is not doing uh, well or, or potentially is an inflammation that persists because you constantly have, you know, some type of damage and your immune system is not responding very well to it can also contribute to tumor growth. So in our, you know, something I, I didn't discuss because I wasn't sure whether it would be too complicated to explain, but but uh, in our uh, prevention strategies, one thing that uh, that cancer immunologists are also doing is really trying to learn how to recognize these what we call pro-tumorigenic inflammatory responses and, and block them, right? So we know, for example, that, you know, in a disease called non you know, NASH or for non-alcoholic uh, steatosis hepatitis. So it's really a fat liver that can predispose patients to have liver cancer. And we know that it's not the fat that inducing, you know, the cancer is that response to that fat that is really going at some point because there's this chronic and persistent inflammation can induce uh, cancer progression. And this works in complicated way, you know, at some point, the, the, the cell being constantly exposed to this inflammatory signal becomes dysregulated and start to have this abnormal ability to multiply. So this is something that also can be prevented maybe by uh, proper nutrition and exercise. And So now before we go, I just wanted to kind of give you a chance to offer your take home message. Uh, you know, I think about where the current research in the field is leading us and what the future of cancer treatment like, might look like. Well, I think the, the cancer treatment is going to change or has changed already forever. You know, every single patient with cancer is going to be treated at some point with immunotherapy. You know, it's a, it's an extraordinary extraordinary time in in um, in medicine and and in cancer care, but also in in medicine in general. Is this realization that we had this whole what we, I describe army of cells that had been protecting us? You know, protecting in fact the human species or all living species for so long, and we have really not taken advantage of that. So knowledge of the regulation of the immune system is going to have a dramatic impact in general and in, in cancer patients in particular. What we have to do is uh, uh, really take advantage of another revolution that's happening in medicine, which is uh, the, the technology revolution.
you know, technology is now enabling us to understand how the immune system is wired or how it's being fooled by the cancer, as I discussed earlier, in a way that was never possible before. So when you, you know, realization of immunotherapy being you know, potentially curative and the technology enabling us to really study the immune system in patients uh, in extreme and uh, uh, with extreme granularity and depth uh, is going to be transformative. It is a fantastic time in medicine. I wholeheartedly agree. So that is all the time that we have for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Murad, for sharing your time and insights with us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, for more of our webinars and the additional resources we have for patients and caregivers as part of CRI's Answer to Cancer educational programs, we encourage you to check out our website at cancerresearch.org patients. Here you can read and watch stories shared by others who have received immunotherapy. You can browse our entire library of past webinars and immunotherapy patient summit series, access other informational resources on treatment, emotional support, and financial assistance, and find help locating an immunotherapy clinical trial. I'd like to thank our sponsors one last time, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as Alchemies and Lilly Oncology for making this webinar series possible. And thank you all for your attention today. I hope you found today's webinar interesting and informative. And again, you can watch this and all of our other webinars on our website at cancerresearch.org slash webinars. Finally, Dr. Murad, thank you again so much and we wish you the best of luck. Oh, my pleasure.